So I want to tell you, growing up, I had two fathers. I had two fathers. I had a biological father and I had a stepfather. And neither of which were spiritual fathers to me. Neither went to church, prayed with me, or gave me biblical examples in which to live my life. Sometimes they mentioned Jesus Christ and God, but it was only when they were really mad. That's why I'm very thankful that I have a mother that took me to church. She took her three children to church, and it was in a small church in West Branch, Michigan, that I met my first spiritual father. I was in middle school, I attended the youth group, and it was Pastor Brad who poured into me as a young middle schooler, my first spiritual father. In high school and college, as I just mentioned, I kind of wandered off in the wilderness, if you will. We'll leave it at that. Then at age 25, I began to seek the Lord. As an adult, I wanted to know what my purpose in life was. I didn't know where to go, so I just started going to my mom's church, because she's the one who's always taking me to church, so I went to my mom's church. By the way, my mother's here today, so praise the Lord that she's a part of, of, of Life of Purpose. And um, it was in that church that actually I met my second spiritual father. God put him in my life, a man named Terry, he led me to Jesus. He answered the myriad of questions that I had about God and, and all of the other uh, questions we have about our faith. But in so many ways, Terry, as a spiritual father, strengthened my faith. In 2002, Jamie and I got married. We started attending a church in Harper Woods. And by the way, if you do the math, this would be our 20th year married next Tuesday. So we were serving together as a brand new couple married in a church in Harper Woods, and it was there that God put multiple spiritual fathers in my life. Our pastor, Sam Jackson, who's now gone to be with the Lord, um, Pastor Sam, uh, Eddie, uh, Wes, uh, Carmen, uh, whom I've mentioned here before many times. These godly men poured into me, uh, 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 kind of a newer Christian, I was in I was the youth pastor at that church, and I eventually became the associate pastor, and then I was called here to Life of Purpose. But godly men pouring into me, Carmen's still a blessing to me. He's always um, calling on me, checking on me, encouraging me, taking me golfing, which I love. And uh, he's, he's a wonderful um, spiritual father. I can't thank God enough for the spiritual fathers that are in my life. I wonder, do you have a spiritual father in your life? And are you, perhaps, a spiritual father to others? Here's the beauty of spiritual fatherhood. Any man can be one. Any man can be a spiritual father. Today I'm going to tell you about two men that we see in the Old Testament. Elijah and Elisha. And they were tremendous spiritual fathers. But they were never married. They didn't have children. You don't have to have biological children to be a spiritual father. In the New Testament, there are two other similar examples. Two men, never married, no kids, yet tremendous spiritual fathers. John the Baptizer and the Apostle Paul. It was the Apostle Paul who said this in 1 Corinthians. For though we have, he says to this to the church, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, and I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is a wonderful father, a spiritual father Paul was. My hope today, on this Father's Day, is that biological fathers, if you're a, a father, of, you have a son or a daughter, there's all kinds of responsibilities that go along with that, I understand that. But I'm calling on you to be a spiritual father to them. Make that your top priority. I understand completely what it's like to run your kid around to every sport in town. I know what it's like to want to have your kid do this or do that. But let me tell you something. Be their spiritual father first and foremost. I want to call on all men to desire to become spiritual fathers to others. 
all men, any man, can be a spiritual father. I want to call on our women to praise those men in your life when they act like spiritual fathers. When you see them doing spiritual father things, praise them. Because men, we love praise, don't we? Yes, we do. And children, teenagers, young adults, as the command goes, honor your father so it will go well with you. Honor them. Sometimes you're going to see your father do things that you're like, eh, eh, I don't know if that's a good fatherly thing there. But we honor and we respect them and revere them. The Lord teaches us to do that. So that's what I'm praying for today. For all of us, we all have something we can do in the, in the area of spiritual fatherhood. Will you pray with me? Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Father in, G- Father in heaven, thank you for your son Jesus. Father, I know that today is a day where it can be so wonderful and yet so tough for some of us. Just like Mother's Day, there's for some a sadness that comes with Father's Day because of a loss. But God, we know that you love us, that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, and you take us to the mountaintop, and you prepare a table before us up there. Father, you're always with us. You never leave us. You love us. You care about us. And today on this Father's Day, I pray, Father, that you will bless all of us. I pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So if you go into the book of 1 Kings, which is in the Old Testament, you'll read kind of all the way through it. God bless you. And, and you'll get all the way through, and you'll get almost to the end in chapter 17, and you'll be introduced to this famous prophet. Uh, there's not a ton about him, but yet he's very famous, and actually he, he, there is a lot about him in the New Testament even. His name is Elijah. Elijah is a famous prophet, and a prophet had this daunting task of turning people's hearts back to God. Because oftentimes people tend to worship idols. Idols. I mean, not that Americans can relate, you know, to worshiping actors and musicians and famous people. We don't do that very much, do we, Americans? That's sarcasm. We need an Elijah right now, America, let me tell you that. Being a prophet... It's, it wasn't a desirable role. It's not like people were lining up to be prophets because oftentimes they would get into some trouble because they would say things to people, they would speak up because people messed up. So their job was to tell people, you messed up, you're screwing up. Turn back to God, and boy, you love it when people tell you you mess up, don't you? I don't. No, it hurts. I don't want to hear that. So I'm sure the prophets probably said many times in their own way, don't shoot the messenger. Because <laughs> that's what they were. They were messengers from God, speaking the words of God to the people to turn their hearts back to God. A couple years ago, I told you that a prophet was like a defibrillator. A defibrillator. You know what those are? You take those pads, you put them on the heart, and it shocks them back to life. You know the sound? <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's the goal of a prophet, to shock their hearts back to God. And Elijah did that pretty well. In fact, there was a time where he had this showdown on Mount Carmel. You, you, you might remember, it was a showdown against the, the, the um, false prophets that were leading the people to worship false gods. And they would worship gods like, you know, the god of fertility or the god of, you know, they wanted the things that we want. They want families, they want their crops to grow, they want all of that. And so they, they make up these gods or they, they worship these gods that they think will you know, give them crops or families or, or money or whatever. Well, 
Elijah has this showdown, and, and whoever can call down fire from heaven onto the altar um, would be the, the one true God. And only, only Elijah's God came through. And so he wins this, this I, you know, I, I liken it to you know, the thrill in Manila, but this is the fire fell on Mount Carmel. Uh, that's what happened there. And so Elijah walked with God his whole life until the time when it was for him to depart. If you know the story, you know that he didn't die. He was one of those prophets that didn't experience a physical death on earth. He went up to heaven, and he didn't, he didn't die. It was a miraculous thing that happened in 2 Kings 2, and I'm going to get you there in a little bit here. But before his departure, Elijah became a spiritual father to another man named Elisha. And when I say those two names, boy, they sound just the same, don't they? I'm going to help you with that right now. Class, it's time to learn Hebrew. You ready? Okay, so we say Elijah and Elisha. That's how we pronounce them. But the truth is, if you were in Hebrew school, and I actually conferred with a, a, a lady in our church who actually teaches at a Hebrew school, a Jewish school, and she, I, I, I didn't just YouTube it, all right, I... I I actually check my resources. And just to help you out, um, Elijah and Elisha, uh, pronounced in the Hebrew, okay, you would never confuse the names. We do all the time because it's the way we pronounce them, but you would not confuse them in the Hebrew pronunciation. So that's what I'm going to use today. But I just give you a little background of their name. So the first part of their name, E L L, we say El, right? Elijah, El, it's not really, it's L, and it means God. And the second part of Elijah's name, Jah, is short for Jehovah. That's the name of God that they would never say out loud. They revered God so much that they would never say Jehovah. But his name means God is Jehovah. El Jah. All right, but it's actually pronounced Eliyahu, because they don't pronounce the J. So Elijah is not Elijah. It's actually Eliyahu. Eliyahu. And then um, Elisha is the uh, name El, God, and then Shah is, is, means salvation. So his name means God is salvation. And it's pronounced Elisha. Not Elisha, like the girl's name, but Elisha. So let's say it together. Eliyahu? Elisha. Now you got it. And I'll say them that way, that way you know who I'm talking about. Good job, class. Give yourself a hand, a little hand for that. All right. There's some people in the class that never raise their hand, they never clap, they never talk, never participate. You know who you are. All right, so one day, Eliyahu visited the home of Elisha, and when he visited his house, he passed by him. Elisha was out farming, and he passed by him, and Eliyahu cast his cloak upon Elisha. Now, the cloak, the, the mantle, as it's called, means glory, and it was special to a prophet. And when he did that, he was saying to Elisha, you're going to be a prophet. You're going to be a prophet like me. He was calling them to be a prophet. And they became inseparable. Eliyahu and Elisha. And nobody ever had trouble with their names. They didn't know who, like we do, they knew who they were talking about. So now we are in 2 Kings chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, open up 2 Kings chapter 2. And it's on the screen if you don't have a Bible. If you want a Bible, there are in the chairs in front of you. Grab one. They're yours to keep. Verse 1. When the Lord was about to take Eliyahu up to heaven by a whirlwind. So here we are at the point at which he's about to depart. His time on earth is done, and he's going to go. And he was taken up to heaven by a whirlwind. Eliyahu and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, a city. And Eliyahu said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So then they went down to Bethel, another city. And in Bethel, the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And I love this. He says, Yes, I know. Keep quiet. 
Elijah, or Eli, Eliyahu said to him, Elisha, please stay here. The Lord has sent me now to Jericho. You see what he's trying to do here. He's trying to separate himself. But he said, Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. And at Jericho, the sons of the prophets came out, drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you not know today the Lord? Everybody knows. Take away your master from over you. And he says, yes, I know. Keep quiet. Then Eliyahu said to him, Please stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan River. But he said, As the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And then in verse 7, 50 men of the sons of prophets also went and stood at some distance to watch what was about to happen as they were standing by the Jordan. So Elisha is standing by his spiritual father. He is not letting him go. And when you study this passage, when you read this passage on your own, certainly some questions will come to mind. I find that when I read the Bible, I'll read a chapter a day, sometimes in the old, sometimes in the new, and when I read the chapter, I might, something might pop out at me. But then I read it again, and let me tell you, it's like pop, pop, pop. And then I read it again, and then it's like popcorn really going. Because now everything is, oh, oh. And then I start to do some reading um, uh, what verses, like, oh, where did that, that happen over here? They said that over here. And it can, you don't need to read a lot. But when you really dig into it, the Holy Spirit opens your eyes. And you begin to see what God wants you to see. And you understand what God wants you to understand. And so you'll have questions like, were there prophets in every city they went to? How many prophets were there? Who are these sons of the prophets? And I want to answer those questions for you this morning because you might have had them from before. About a hundred years earlier, so if we could rewind a hundred years from Eliyahu and Elisha, we would hear about a prophet named Samuel in the book of 1 Samuel in 2 Samuel, in the, book, in the Bible. And a hundred years earlier, Samuel was the last judge before the first king for the Hebrew people, the Israelites. And in 1 Samuel 7, I got this verse up here for you, verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And Samuel, being a prophet, went on a circuit year after year. This was his, his little circuit that he would do. And he would go Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. He had key cities he visited, and in those cities, by the way, were schools of prophets. I would call them seminaries today. These were seminary students in these cities. These were prophets in school, learning, training, and Samuel would visit them. And 100 years later, Eliyahu and Elisha are traveling these same cities and they are spending time with these other prophets. You say, oh, how many are there? I would venture to say that there were at least 7,000. I'll tell you why in a little bit. 7,000 may ring a bell to you. If it doesn't, think about when you look at the life of Eliyahu And it says that God told him, I have reserved, because he thought he was all alone, I have reserved 7,000 that have not bowed down to false gods. Where do those 7,000 come from? Probably these cities. They are the sons of the prophets, as they call them. So all of these prophets understand that Eliyahu is leaving, but Elisha is staying close, not letting him go, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, that was like a saying, I'm not leaving you. Like father and son, they were together. But here we are standing by the Jordan River now. It doesn't matter how close or how tightly Elisha holds on to his spiritual father. It's time. God is going to take him up. Verse 8, Eliyahu took his cloak, that special cloak, rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted one side to the other, till the two of them could walk on dry ground. 
They crossed over. Eliyahu said to Elisha, ask, what shall I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha says this, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, boy, you've asked a hard thing, but if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you don't see me, it's not going to happen. And they went on and talked, and behold, in the midst of their conversation, chariots of fire and horses of fire separates the two of them, and Eliyahu went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha says and cries out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. So Elisha sees Eliyahu ascend into heaven, so that means he will receive this double portion. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy it says that the firstborn receives a double portion of his inheritance. The firstborn son is the one to carry on the legacy of the father. So Elisha is going to carry on the legacy of Eliyahu. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to carry on this ministry, and he would do that. In fact, right away, verse 14, the cloak falls. He doesn't take it with him. The cloak falls, and Eliyahu... Uh, verse 14, it says, He took the cloak of Eliyahu that had fallen from him, and he struck the water, and he said, Where's the Lord, the God of Eliyahu? And when he struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. So he doesn't call on or think that this, this uh, miracle will happen because of this special cloak. Notice what his faith is in. It's not in the cloak. It's not in that, that clothing. It's in the God of Eliyahu. It's in God. It really saddens me when I hear about people who put their faith in trinkets or statues to bring themselves favor. That's not what brings you favor. It's God who brings you favor. Put your faith in God, not in those other things. You may be wondering from this passage, what's going on with these chariots of fire and horses of fire? That's God's spiritual army. Did you know God has a spiritual army? I hope you know that. In fact, one of my favorite passages is here in 2 Kings chapter 6. Because from here, Elisha goes out and does ministry and some fun things happen that I've shared before. But in 2 Kings chapter 6, he's in Dothan. And he's with a servant, and the king of Syria, the enemy, surrounds him. And the reason why he's surrounding him is because every time the king of Syria goes up against the king of Israel, Elisha basically hears from God and goes and tells the king of Israel what the king of Syria is about to do. He reveals his plans. And so the king of Syria is like scratching his head. It's like, how is this happening? How is this happening? And somebody says, it's because of Elisha. He's telling him all your secrets. So he's like, okay, I'm going to take care of him. So he goes and sends out his army, and he surrounds them as they're in Dothan. And they come out of their tent, and Elisha's servant is freaking out. He's panicking. What are we going to do? We're surrounded. We're done for. It's, we're over. And then it says in 2 Kings 6, verse 16, Elisha says, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What are you talking about? There's, there's nobody else here, the servant's thinking. But then Elisha prays and says, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opens the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around them. God's spiritual army is there. No army on earth can stand up against God's spiritual army. And by the way, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's a spiritual battle oftentimes that we are in. And here, Elisha reveals that and they see that. You may be wondering about this whirlwind also that took Eliyahu up into heaven. What, what, what's a whirlwind? Well, it's like a hurricane. 
And we don't have a lot of details about it, but it must have been an amazing sight to see. Probably kind of scary. But those 50 men were watching, and they, and they saw uh, uh, something interesting, fascinating to think about. Elisha went on to serve faithfully. His stories are always exciting to read and to share. Fathers, you can share them with your children, uh, especially the one about uh, when they made fun of him because he was bald. There were some boys that made fun of him, and then the, a bear came and mauled him to death. So just keep that in mind. Children, you make fun of your dad who's bald. But Eliyahu raised the boy back to life, and so did Elisha, and they both spent time with these families, no doubt being spiritual fathers to them. But what can we understand? What, what is spiritual fatherhood? What do we see from these two men? How do they help us become spiritual fathers? That's what you always want. You want something you can apply to your life, and I'll give it to you. First, a spiritual father spends time with his spiritual children. Time. Time is critical. Eliyahu and Elisha spent time together. You know how we know that? Because they had to walk everywhere together. Okay, we're going to the next city. Well, that wasn't a 10-minute walk. That was a long walk. And so they spent time together. Un, you know, they weren't distra- it wasn't distracted time. It was intentional time. It was consistent time. And, it, and, and we, we, have, we all have ups and downs in our life. We all have things that happen good, things that happen bad. And when we do, we need a spiritual father to help us navigate them, don't we? Yeah. A spiritual father will take the time to listen and answer questions. I mentioned my friend, my, my spiritual father, Terry. Man, when I first became a Christian, I had so many questions, and he took the time to answer them. He never rejected a phone call. He always was willing to sit there with me and he encouraged me and he he gave me wisdom from the Word of God. If you want to be a spiritual father, you must take the time. Time is important. Cancel the meetings. Forget about the honeydew list on the refrigerator. Sorry, ladies. Take the time. Spend it. Be a spiritual father. Secondly, a spiritual father is patient. I mean, think about how patient Eliyahu was with Elisha before his departure. Okay, I'm going to Bethel. Stay here. Nope, I'm coming with you. I'm going to Jericho. Stay here. Nope, I'm coming with you. I'm going to the Jordan. Stay here. No, I'm coming with you. Eliyahu had such patience with Elisha. Maturity doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a week, a month, even a year. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have setbacks. But a spiritual father doesn't give up. He just keeps building up. And we need those spiritual fathers. It's a process. So be patient. Spend time. Be patient. Thirdly, a spiritual father protects. Protects. I read this story recently of how Native Americans train their young braves. When a young boy turns 13, he's blindfolded and taken into a dense forest. Then they remove the blindfold, and he's left to be there all night. It's pitch black. Spends the whole night in the dark. Every time a twig snaps, he wonders if it's a wild animal ready to pounce on him. The wind blows. He doesn't know if a storm is coming. He's terrified. 13 years old, in a forest, dark, can't see his hand in front of his face, and he's all alone. But then the first rays of sunlight come into the forest. He begins to see around him, sees flowers, sees trees, and then not even 10 feet away, he sees a man holding a bow and arrow. And it's his father who's been standing there the whole night protecting him. It's a wonderful example of how God protects us and how spiritual fathers can protect us. And by the way, we have our own version of this story in America. We call it helicopter parents. You know the parents. They're always 10 feet away, protecting, hovering over, But it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, right? At some point, we have to teach our kids to protect themselves. 
We can't hover over them forever. We have to give them the tools. And as many of you know, and as I shared with you, our battle isn't often against flesh and blood. It's against the spiritual forces, the evil that's in the world, the spiritual darkness. And we need this armor of God that's talked about in Ephesians chapter 6. And a spiritual father will help suit up their child with this armor of God. With the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith. And and the word of God, which is the sword. A spiritual father teaches spiritual things. He helps you discern the will of God with the word of God. He helps you apply biblical principles to everyday life situations. That is how a spiritual father protects you. Takes the time, is patient, and protects. And fourthly, not finally, because I could be here all day talking to you about the marks of the spiritual father, but just fourthly and finally for today, a spiritual father prays. Prays. He intercedes for a spiritual son or daughter regularly. And he becomes a safe person to confess sins to. We often don't think about confessing our sins to one another, but James tells us we should do that in chapter 5, verse 16. James says, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed, because the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. If you've ever had a person in your life that you could confess your sin to and not be judged, just simply be loved, encouraged to repent of your sin, be lifted up, boy, that's a wonderful person to have in your life. And that's what a spiritual father is. They're a safe person that you can go to and confess your sins to. And I think it's interesting that the, for us today, who, who James mentions as this man who is a powerful prayer warrior Verse 17, Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He's just like us. He prayed fervently. It might not rain for three years and six months. It didn't rain. He prayed again. It did rain. And the land bore fruit. Because the prayer of a righteous person, the prayer of a spiritual father, availeth much. So may our spiritual fathers pray with power. Do you need a spiritual father? Are you a spiritual father? What would build up Life of Purpose Church more than anything than having an abundance of spiritual fathers? So I'm calling on you men. Make it your top priority. Be a spiritual father. Any man can be a spiritual father. And I'm calling on you ladies. Praise the men in your life when they do the spiritual things. And don't nag them. Does that ever really work? Praise them. Praise them when they do spiritual things. It's a difference maker. And I'm calling on you children to honor your father. And look for, pray for, ask God to put a spiritual father in your life. Because he'll do that. Bobby's going to come up. AJ's going to come up. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Because we all need grace, especially on Father's Day. But I want to pray for you, and if you, if you need prayer, if you need someone to pray for you, if there's something going on in your life today, something big, something little, and you want prayer, we have a prayer team that's committed to praying for you. We want to pray for you as well. But um, Let me pray, and then we'll stand and we'll sing this final song. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you so much that you love us and that you're our Father, as Jeff said, every day. Every day is Father's Day. We can praise you. We can seek you. We can know that you're there for us, not even 10 feet away, protecting us. I pray, Father, that you will raise up more men in this church to be spiritual fathers, mentors, encouraging our young people. I pray that you will empower them through your Holy Spirit. As we see these men like Elijah, 
Elisha, Eliyahu, Elisha, that they had the Spirit, your Holy Spirit, resting on them, empowering them to do your will. I pray that for us as well. In Jesus' name.